Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a great honor. It's a privilege to be here. Congratulations to Norway and especially to NORAD on your 50th anniversary. Um, you know, I come from a small think tank in Washington, D.C. It's called the Center for Global Development. And we feel a certain kinship with NORAD and with Norway because we're small. Um, and like you, we aim to punch above our weight with the big contenders. And I think that like NORAD, um, well, maybe it's immodest to say, but we like to think of ourselves as more able and willing to experiment and to innovate and to come up with new ideas. Um, that's something that's easier to do, perhaps, when you're small. And that is one way that we see from afar uh, NORAD operating. And I think in particular, I would single out just the fact that the report on your 50 years is called a results report. So from the start, for the next 50 years, uh, you're emphasizing the importance of results in itself. I'm also really honored to take the same stage that uh, your former prime minister, a great heroine to everyone in development, uh, Gro Brundtland, will be taking later on today. So what I'm going to do is talk about three ideas or three propositions about the way uh, development space has been changing. And then I'm going to give three specific or concrete proposals that we've been working on and thinking about at the Center for Global Development. Each is a bit radical in some ways, but at the same time, quite practical. Um, and each is related to uh, natural resource management, which I understand is an important theme, obviously, in Norway, uh, perhaps a theme at this conference. And in particular, how the development community writ large out there can build on the leadership Norway has provided in the area of natural resource management and can um, benefit from the model that Norway has provided in its own management of uh, its natural resource oil. And the thread that will run through much of what I say, and probably I'll say it too often and you'll hear it repeated, is um, how fundamental it is in this new development space to think more about the role of empowered and informed citizens. Not just here, I mean all of you in a way are informed and empowered citizens to think globally, but in, in the developing world as well, uh, and in the rising middle income countries like China, India, and so on. So let me go to the three propositions. The first one is that development space is merging with global space. Now, what do I mean by global space? I mean the gradual but marked increase in the space for action by globally minded citizens. Um, in a sort of more technical sense, it has to do with the unbundling of the tight relationship between sovereignty and territoriality which is kind of very 19th and 20th century, um, or between sovereignty and citizenship at the level of territory on the one hand, and geography and territoriality on the other. Just, you know, the discussion and the challenges faced by the European Union and by the Eurozone is one example of that. We're in a, we're in a different world in many ways than the what political scientists called the Westphalian uh, world of the 19th century and certainly of the pre 20th of the 20th first half of the 20th century. So why is this happening? Uh, much more of our lives every day are affected by global forces and there are so many more channels for us to act as citizens at the global level. Um, you're all familiar with the ideas and the symptoms and the causes of this expansion of global space. You know, Facebook, um, global supply chains that affect the way we operate in the working world, um, the gradual but uh, 
well, let's say SARS um, and other potential global pandemics, just the contagion, the financial contagion that occurred when the global financial crisis started in the US and the UK, how it affected everyone in the world. Glo the price, food price hikes in 2008. So we're all familiar with those symptoms and causes. Um, in the development space, so that's kind of global space increasing in a way that's not always so easy to define, but I think everybody feels it all the time. So what does it mean for the development community? I think the development community is, is perforce operating more and more in this global space. And that is because this interdependence that is the partner of growing global space is affecting the lives of the poor um, in so many ways, both on the risk side, as with climate change, as the minister mentioned, where there are dire consequences already, which are far worse the poorer you are, whether you're in a poor country with weak institutions or you're a poor person without the income um, and the, the means to adjust to any kind of a shock or a change. Uh, so that's just one example, but there's the forest issue in itself, which I'll come to in a few moments. Think of the global energy market where we're all sort of users and potential victims of price volatility. Um, so we have a lot of problems now as citizens in Norway and in my country, the US, that are shared with the world's poor. Um, it's not as tough. You know there's a kind of terrible asymmetry in the way the global risks affect the poor more than the rich. They're more problematic in terms of welfare. But the fact is that they are shared global problems. So there's this increasing attention in the development community to global public goods and other cross-border issues. Uh, it's all the way from climate change to, say, sex and drug trafficking. Um, now, it's not that what happens inside developing countries matters less. And here, you know, the intersection with the work that's in the narrower area of aid itself comes. It's, it, on the contrary, what happens inside developing countries, really, their future is 90, 95, 98% determined by what their people, their societies, and their leaders do or fail to do. So that's not the issue. The issue is that the other 5 or 10% is where uh, I believe the global community and the outside community um, have the comparative advantage, both in minimizing harm and in finding ways to do more good. Um, I already mentioned climate change, which is the classic example where harm needs to be minimized. Uh, I mentioned the global financial crisis. That started in the US and the UK. So a lot of what the development community is grappling with is not only doing aid to do good, but finding ways in the international system to have the international system operate in a way that does less harm and does more good. The international trade regime, international migration regimes, all these areas where there's an international system that we sort of take for granted sometimes. All these areas uh, have both potential to expand opportunities for the world's poor in the development sense, uh, to shift growth to be more inclusive and sustainable, and they also have potential to do harm. Uh, the, the one also that I, I don't want to fail to mention is the reality that over the last 30, 40 years, we have liberalized the capital market so that capital can flow rapidly across countries. And we have taken just tiny baby steps to liberalize the labor market, the global labor market. So there's a huge, there's some harm that's done to many people who end up as second class citizens in a country like mine because they're undocumented. And there's huge uh, capacity to do good with really modest increases in the number of 
uh, unskilled poor people that could be admitted to uh, the rich, rich countries. Here's where my own country is probably, in some ways, um, the most problematic, but perhaps it will change. So I guess in the area of natural resource management, which is a kind of a theme for NORAD, um, this issue of how the international system works is very fundamental. Um, and the problem is that too often it seems as though the global system turns a blind eye to corruption. Not necessarily, you know, in the development community fomenting corruption, on the contrary, but just by a kind of willful naivete in some cases seems to legitimize the institutionalization of corruption within countries um, where uh, there are, there's a new wealth of, say, oil or other minerals. So that's my first proposition, is the merging of development space with global space and the increasing sense in an asymmetric system that we have to go beyond aid, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, to find ways to minimize harm and to see that as very fundamental to uh, development work. Second proposition is that, kind of saying the same thing in a way, that the development community is, we're in our infancy with respect to new tools and uh, new approaches to do this work beyond traditional aid and to work in global space. I think the mindset is changing more rapidly than the obvious practical tools that can be used to um, make a difference. And so we have traditional aid, um, which is government to government for the most part, very much in the mindset of there's, a rich, there's rich countries and there's poor countries, and we do transfers to do good. Sometimes it's multilateral institutions to government. Um, sometimes it's the Gates Foundation. You know, it can be people to people as well, uh, phil philanthropists to, to people in the developing world. But it's very much rich to poor. It's like the charitable or philanthropic way of thinking about uh, doing development. And this approach will and should continue for sure. Uh, there's been tremendous amount of good done in the world because of traditional aid, uh, transformation in people's lives, better health, um, girls in school, women's rights, etc. the new norms that have come about. Because aid has been a vehicle for conversation as well as for getting something done. But the world is changing. We have the rise of the middle class in China, India, Brazil, many other middle income countries. Um, it, there's a shift in geopolitical power, a tectonic shift going on. Um, many countries, including low income countries, do not, as many of you will know in the aid community, want to see themselves as supplicants for more money. No, they want to see themselves and in the development world, we want to see them as partners uh, addressing more common problems. So um, I think the problem that we face in the development community and in the aid community is that when you go beyond traditional aid, you collide with politics. And here the minister also referred to politics. <coughs> Um, and it gets tougher, it's more complicated. In talking about global space, I referred to the international system and the way it operates. So when you go beyond traditional aid to the do no harm uh, set of ideas, it's far more obvious when vested interests, you know, knock up against what you're trying to do. And it's, it, you're much more in a world of the short term. I mean, people who work in development all the time think long term. That's the idea. But politics is much more likely to be uh, short run. Uh, and in fact, that is the idea in part. So uh, again, we can go back to the, the, the troubles of the European Union right now. 
when you get to immigration reform or, say, tax coordination across rich countries to minimize illicit flows of finance, you're going to run right up against political interests. So it's, it's harder than uh, doing aid to do good through traditional projects. So Tanzania, Mozambique, Ghana, um, the politics, say in Tanzania, where there's all this natural gas offshore, I don't think there's much question that the politics of dealing with that new easy money will be far more difficult than the economics or the engineering. And so that's, but that is now fundamental to the way those of us in the development community should be thinking about the future in a country like Tanzania, obviously. Um, now, even inside the aid world, if we think about results-based aid and the NORAD report on results, you know, I think that truly results-based aid um, pushes into political space within developing countries. It pushes the aid community into a place where it has to think about local politics. Because if you're paying for results, you're passing the risk of getting something done to the country. You can't just go in and get it done yourself or get it done by, you know, pushing and fussing, right, and advising and supporting specific inputs. You're, you're, you're wanting this, the country's own politics to push in the direction of getting something good done, whether it's more girls in school or fewer babies dying or getting the road built or whatever it is. And once you wait, if you're patient in the true results-based mode, you ha you're, start you're going to see how vested interests and short-term worries or po political politics uh, operates or doesn't operate to get it done. And that's hard to do. But that has to be, in, I think, in, in a results-based aid approach, it's absolutely necessary to l see how that might work, let that happen, be ready to provide advice and help. But don't forget the citizens, because that's what I want to come back to, in Tanzania or in Mozambique, in Ghana, in Uganda, in other places where um, new natural resources have been discovered. So let me go to the third proposition, which is trying to bring these two things together in a way. Um, the development community, or maybe I should repeat, the first one is about global space and development space merging. And the second one is, is just repeating that we're better in our mindset in terms of this global space in the development community than we are yet in the way we practice development. Um, it, it's hard to deal with the international system. It's hard to deal with country-specific politics. Um, so we don't have yet the tools beyond traditional aid. And um, the third proposition then is that the development community could focus more, we ought to focus more on inventing, designing, deploying new ways of doing things that kind of confront this particular challenge, both inside the way we do traditional aid and beyond aid per se, or beyond the sort of narrower aid thinking per se. And these new tools should focus wherever possible on informing and empowering citizens, both in rich countries and in, in the poor countries where de the development communities operate to exploit this global space I was referring to. And I'm an optimist about the potential for this. In a way, it seems kind of dreamy, you know, and terribly progressive and all that to, you know, empower citizens. But I'm an optimist in two respects. First, I just, we looked up, I looked up, what's the expansion in the number of international NGOs? I'm sure there are a lot of NGO people here, and many of you probably represent 
in NGOs that are part of an international system. There were 6,000 registered, apparently, in 1990. Ask yourself how many there are today. It's a tenfold increase, approximately, to 60,000 formally registered international NGOs. I've just been on leave this semester teaching in a college in New England, uh, in the US, and you know, anyone who returns to campus at least in the US. Maybe it was this way in Norway a long time ago because Norway's always been more embedded in a larger community. But in the US, there's a transformation. You know, students are so globally minded that you just have to, you know, adjust to it. It's not the way it was 10, 20, well, maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago at all. And we have the rise of what a colleague of mine at the center, Bill Savidoff, calls mixed coalitions, which are groups of civil society and governments and the private sector doing all kinds of things. Now, that's been true over the years. You know, the abolition movement in the 19th century was a kind of mixed coalition. But basically what's happening is you have the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, um, hundreds of other movements that are combining states, private markets, and citizens. And what they're all working on is changing the rules of the game at the international level and within countries. So that's one reason to be optimistic, is that this global space is being filled very much by all kinds of, it seems chaotic in some ways, um, it, sometimes it seems dysfunctional. It would be great if it could all be organized, but maybe not so great. Maybe it's better to let all these flowers bloom. Second reason to be optimistic is the rise of democracy, and particularly with respect to natural resource management challenges in Africa. You know, <clears throat> the minister was talking about Tanzania. It's in a classic case of a country where the mindset is very much about transparency and, you know, the role of citizens, it's a very open system in Tanzania. So I think there's, there's NGOs within Tanzania that are working on you know, transparency, accountability, information, sort of, sort of healthy, benign lobbying for a better government. And in a place like Uganda, there are a couple of NGOs that are working very hard and are very anxious about the legislation right now that will govern the way the new oil is used. And, you know, it's really tense and they're really under fire in many ways. But they're there and they're sticking to it and they have support. And even in China, you have, you know, a sense that citizens are, are active at the local level. And of course, we have the Arab Spring. So often, citizens are ahead of their politicians is one way to think of this. Um, politicians are perforce forced to be <laughs> short-sighted sometimes. And bu bureaucrats who, by nature, are forced to be risk-averse. Those of you who come from Nor NORAD, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, wedded to familiar habits and protocols where you can get it done more easily and you won't get you know, hit back with new questions and new problems. So. Uh, it's interesting, the majority of citizens polled in all countries, for example, say that global warming is a threat and action needs to be taken, but we can't get anywhere. We're, we're, it's so slow, right? Some of your delegates have come back from Doha and it's really tough. Two thirds of Americans, two thirds of Americans would back an international agreement to cut carbon emissions by 90% by 2050, according to polls. And yet the U.S. House of Representatives has voted 316 times in the last 12 months against uh, any environmental protection measures. So sometimes there's a disjunction between what citizens want and how they can channel their views to um, their legislatures. So on sustainability, you know, there's this gap between citizens and politicians and on inclusiveness and fairness 
uh, we see the same gap over and over again. In the US, there's far more support for, for sort of inclusive aid programs, for supporting education and health programs. There was huge support for President Bush's PEPFAR program to save lives. There's far more of that kind of support than for anything that has to do with uh, the international system writ large. And I think citizens in poor countries are, sub are often ahead of their politicians as well. So let me go to um, my th uh, three examples quickly, because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, these are all examples for um, building on the changes and building on Norway's experience in particular and the model Norway has provided um, in natural resource management. And I'll try to go through them quickly, but the abiding theme is an empowered citizen that has good information, fairly simple because, you know, it should be shared information. Everyone should have a sense of what's going on in order to make the system politics more accountable at the local and global level. So it's within countries, rich and poor, and, in the, and it's for overall global citizens too. Um, so simple and practical ways to proceed, sometimes inside the aid system and sometimes outside the aid system. So the first example is what we call at the Center for Global Development, uh, Forest Conservation Performance Rating. Mm, it's a long name, FCPR. It builds very much on Norway's leadership in paying for performance in the case of Brazil and the programs that are planned for Indonesia, Guyana. Um, so this FCPR, this conservation performance rating, it's a rating, it's a scorecard that rates countries by their performance against a, a, a baseline, which is calculated, you know, rough, good enough measure of a baseline, and then We'll, we will be scoring all forest cu countries against this um, simple baseline. It's a function of their income per capita, basically, um, in the next couple of years. And it's using free satellite imagery. And colleagues of mine at the center are now able to do this for virtually all countries in the developing world. <laughs> at the level of, I don't know, two or three square meters. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, it's measuring changes in forest cover. So it's, it's like what the Brazilians do that many of you are more familiar with, but it's a little bit rougher and universal. And they can do it every two weeks. And this was developed at the center and it's now being managed at the World Resources Institute, which some of you might know is a, another think tank in Washington, D.C that um, specializes in environmental issues and has done for, so for maybe 30 years. Um, it could provide a basis for an interim period for a much more vigorous and rigorous approach to the red issue, the reducing forest degradation and deforestation in the following way. Imagine that other countries looked at what Norway's done in the case of Brazil, and said, we're going to do it for a while in a simple way. We're going to announce some payment for percentage reductions in deforestation. No negotiations with countries, no agreements, but at the end of the year, we're just going to transfer resources, a certain amount, per increment in reduced deforestation. After the first year, Let's see how it works. There might have to be adjustments and so on. But it will automatically create an incentive in a large number of countries, including for citizens of those countries, and including for citizens in the donor countries that participate, to think, well, what's happening? Is there reductions or increases in deforestation, and why and how within my country and in other countries. So it avoids the complications of negotiations. It relies on simple measurement, simple stories, what's happening. It can be done for small countries, Liberia, as well as big countries in terms of forests. Um, no contracts. It's just announce the intention, pay after a year, create the incentives. Payments are incremental, ex post and periodic. 
uh, would ha the Amazon fund approach and what Norway has done provide an excellent starting point. Without that, I'm not sure we would even be thinking about this sort of approach. It takes patience, of course, you have to wait. It might not work right away, uh, but I think patience is what the development community should be good at. Um, and other donors might start to chip in. I mean, that would be the idea that there would be more of a global pool. So that's one example that we're working on. It's not going to be easy. You want me to stop? Okay, I'll go very quickly. The second one is oil to cash uh, in a country like Tanzania where uh, the idea is to uh, advise countries to take some of the net income, a country like Tanzania, from their new resource and distribute it directly to citizens and then work on taxing it back and have the tax system become the basis for a social contract as it is in a mature democracy. Now, it's very nice in the results report, there's a very polite, careful uh, discussion of the fact that Norway was already a democratic country with strong institutions when you found oil. And so what does Norway have to, to do with something as radical, but in, in some ways simple, as distributing on a net income basis directly to citizens? Well, Norway has asked for advice. And it's clear in the report that there's a deep understanding here about how important it is to have those institutions in place that have empowered citizens to make the government accountable for the way it disposes of this new easy money. So when Norway has asked for advice to go beyond consider a sovereign wealth fund, to go beyond you know, consider the future, the patrimony, the sustainability, et cetera, to go beyond the advice on how to do the concession, to think about how to minimize the problem of corruption. Don't become Nigeria and Angola, right? You know, you're all familiar with this worry. And this would build on what we call at the center cash on delivery aid. Use transparency, use information to citizens. Citizens would know I'm getting $60 or $100 or $1,000 a year. And if I don't get it, I'm gonna ask why. And then there's a demand at the local level for taxing back those resources. And the third example I won't even say more about is that publish what you buy. Now, this is the UK and Colombia do this. Let me close by saying the theme here is citizen action. I think in Norway you take it for granted because you have it. You're representing it here. But uh, the idea is enforcing accountability on governments. And in the development community, I believe we can make this work if we think harder about it, both inside the way we do aid and beyond aid in addressing the challenges in the global system. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you.